Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at a diatomic molecule, which is just a molecule that is made out of two atoms, which may or may not be of the same type. And what we're going to do is calculate the natural frequency of vibrations or oscillations of that molecule. And we're going to see how the concept of reduced mass arises uh, in the context of this problem. So we're going to take an energy based approach to this problem. And we're going to start by thinking about the potential energy in particular. Now, what I have uh, in this plot you can see here is a sketch of the potential energy of interaction of the two atoms as a function of their separation r. So this r here is just the distance between the two atoms. And for the purposes of this video, the functional form of this curve doesn't really matter. But just for completeness, I'll note that it is often approximated as some constant a divided by r to the 12 minus some constant b divided by r to the 6. OK, and this is called the Leonard Jones potential, if you want to look that up uh, and read about it a bit more. So the main feature that we can immediately observe in this curve is that there is a clear minimum down here. right? So if we say that that minimum occurs at a separation of r0 or r0, then that r zero is just the equilibrium separation of the atoms, right? So we could interpret that as basically a bond length in this molecule. So let's think about what happens if we change the separation. So for example, if we try to pull the atoms apart and we bring our system to a separation somewhere over here, what's going to happen is um, they're going to feel a force pulling back to equilibrium. Um, your system is going to move back towards that minimum. Similarly, if you push the atoms too close together and bring the system uh, somewhere over here, again, they don't want to be too close together. And so the system will come back towards equilibrium from that direction. So if we look now specifically at small displacements from equilibrium, let's say you bring the system over to this point here, right? So you just kind of stretch the molecule slightly, um, then what's going to happen is you, you'll get little oscillations uh, in this potential well here, right? And so basically the atoms start, they've been stretched apart, they'll come back to equilibrium, but they're going to overshoot a bit. Um, and then you know, there'll be a bit of compression and then that cycle will just continue, right? So you're going to get this kind of oscillation um, or vibration within this potential well. And that's the oscillation that we're trying to find the frequency of. So let's get started on, on the maths of this. And what we're going to do is say that the separation of the atoms, R, is going to be the equilibrium separation, R0, plus some small displacement, um, which I'm going to call capital X. Right? So that's the displacement from equilibrium in terms of atomic separation. Um, and let's also know that X is small, so we could say that it's much less than, than R0. And we are going to find an approximation um, of U of R near equilibrium. And so we're basically going to do a Taylor expansion. So we can say that u of r is u of r zero. Okay, we start um, at equilibrium, then we add on a little contribution du by dr, evaluated at r zero, times our small displacement x, and then let's have a second order contribution as well, which is a half d two u by dr squared, evaluated at r naught um, times x squared, and this series in principle goes on forever we're going to just truncate it there not include the higher order terms because x is small so how can we simplify this well note that by definition of r naught r naught is um at the the minimum of the curve right at, at the minimum of the curve the first derivative is zero right so actually this linear term in x just disappears because du by dr at r0 is 0 by definition. Um, and so what we've got is that u of r is approximately equal to u of r0. And let's use some nice concise notation here. There's no linear term. The quadratic term can be written as a half u double prime of r0 times x squared, Okay, where double prime just indicates a second derivative. So there you go. That's the potential energy. Um, and now we want to start thinking about the kinetic energy of the system. So let's just write here kinetic energy. And to write the kinetic energy of the system or of the, the molecule, 
it's going to be necessary to define a few new quantities. And so I'm going to just draw a diagram to clarify what these quantities are. So we've got an atom there and an atom there. Um, and they're at this equilibrium separation of R0. And let's say we pull this one on the left to its left. Let me redraw that arrow to its left by some amount, which is given by x1. And we pull the one on the right to its right by some amount, which is x2. And let's also define the masses of these atoms to be m1 uh, and m2. So I've drawn those x1 and x2 arrows um, as different lengths because in general, they're not going to be the same, as we'll see shortly. So given these newly defined parameters, um, we can say the kinetic energy, let's call it Ek, is just going to be a half. Um, so we're going to get the kinetic energy of the first atom, which is going to be a half m1. And then we get x1 dot squared, where a dot is a time derivative, right? So this x1 dot is the velocity of atom one. And then we get a similar contribution from atom two. Uh, so maybe we can factor out the half because that's going to be common to both terms. So we get a half of m1 x1 dot squared plus m2 x2 dot squared. Right, so at the moment we can't make much progress because we've got all these variables. Um, we've got capital X um, and we've also got x1 and x2. So let's try to kind of reduce the number of degrees of freedom in this problem and express x1 and x2 in terms of capital X so that it's in the same kind of form as the potential energy. So how can we do that? Well, there are a couple of constraints on x1 and x2. The first of these is just going to be that if we add x1 and x2 together, what do we get? Well, that is the total amount of displacement from equilibrium, right? Which you can see just by looking at this diagram, right? We've got this displacement x1 to the left, x2 to the right. If we add them together, that's the total amount um, that the atoms have been displaced through equilibrium. So that is by definition just capital X. Okay, so what else do we know? Um, well, there is no external force acting on our molecule, which means that the center of mass of the molecule is not actually moving. Now, if the center of mass is not moving, um, we can say that m1 x1 has to be equal to m2 x2. Right, so that comes from the fact the center of mass is not moving. You can also understand it in terms of um, conservation of momentum, um, writing down the conservation of momentum equation and integrating both sides with respect to time. Um, so either way, you get to this result, um, which we can easily rearrange to make x2 the subject. x2 is going to be m1 over m2 times x1. So if we take this expression for x2, substitute it back into equation 1, let's see what's going to happen. We'll get x1, um, and then we're going to get plus m2, sorry, m1 over m2 times x1. So let's factor out an x1. We get x1 times 1 plus m1 over m2 is equal to x. Um, so let's rearrange that uh, just to make x1 the subject. Write x1 in terms of capital X. x1 is just going to be x over that bracketed factor, 1 plus m1 over m2. And then we can just make this look a bit nicer by multiplying up uh, by m2. And so we find x1 is m2 capital X over m1 plus m2. And once we've got that, we immediately know x2 as well, because we just multiply by this ratio m1 over m2. So we can write down that x2 is going to be m1x divided by m1 plus m2. And what that means is we can now express the kinetic energy in terms of uh, just capital X, right? It's not going to depend on, on x1 um, and x2. So let's go back to this expression up at the top for kinetic energy um, and substitute in our newly found expressions for x1 and x2. So Ek, kinetic energy, is going to be one half of, so our first term is m1 x1 dot squared. So we're basically taking this expression over here for x1, differentiating it once with respect to time and squaring it. So What's going to happen is we get this m1 um, from our ek expression, and then we get an m2 squared and an x dot squared divided by that denominator m1 plus m2 all squared. Okay, just substituting in our expression for x1, 
Um, and then we get a similar term for x2, right? This time we get m2 times m1 squared x dot squared divided by m1 plus m2 all squared. Now, note that there is a common factor of x dot squared in both of these terms, so we can take that out. Um, and also note that they're both terms in the square brackets are over the same denominator, so we can just add the numerators. Okay, so let's do some algebraic simplification. Um, so ek is going to be half of, right, so let's think about the numerator. If we add this m1 m2 squared and m2 m1 squared, there's actually a common factor there of m1 m2, and so we could factor that out, write it as m1 m2, but then we've got an additional factor of m2 from the first term and an additional factor of m1 from the second term. And then that's divided by the common denominator m1 plus m2, all squared. And then we've got this factor of x dot squared. Now, conveniently, this m2 plus m1 cancels with one of the powers on the bottom. And so this simplifies quite nicely to a half of um, m1 m2 over m1 plus m2 times x dot squared. So we've now expressed our kinetic energy in terms of the same parameter x, which we express the potential energy in terms of. Um, so we've got this expression half m1 m2 over m1 plus m2 x dot squared. I'm going to introduce a new definition now, and we're going to call this entire bracketed term mu. And that is the reduced mass of the system. Okay, so we can write that as a half mu um, x dot squared. Now, you can kind of interpret this reduced mass as like an effective mass of this diatomic molecule um, with respect to oscillations, right? Because this kind of looks like the classic form of kinetic energy, which is just a half m times x dot squared, except we've got this combination of the two masses. Uh, so it's kind of like an uh, effective mass for oscillations. Um, note that another way we can juice, we can, we can, sorry, write the reduced mass is um, that mu is one over the reciprocal of m1 plus the reciprocal of m2. With a bit of algebra, you can show that that's equivalent to this uh, definition that we had here. In other words, to get the reduced mass, to get the reciprocal of the reduced mass, you add the reciprocals um, of the two individual masses. So there you go, that's the reduced mass. Um, and let's make some progress towards finding our uh, vibration frequency. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we can take our two contributions to energy, potential energy, U, and kinetic energy, EK, and energy is conserved, right? And so u plus ek equals some constant, which is not changing with time. So we can add those energies together and differentiate them with respect to time and get zero because energy is conserved. So if we do that, we're going to get an equation of motion. Um, so let's do that differentiation with respect to time. So if we differentiate u with respect to time, this u of r naught disappears because that's just a constant. The second term, uh, half u double prime of r naught times x squared, we've got to use the chain rule to differentiate that x squared, right? And so if we differentiate that x squared, we, well, we can first differentiate with respect to x and get 2x, but then we differentiate um, using the chain rule, uh, and so we've got to multiply by the derivative of x with respect to t, which is just x dot, right? Um, so that first term just becomes u double prime of r naught um, times x x dot because this two from the derivative is cancelled with the half um, in front of the u double prime. Okay, so what happens if we differentiate our kinetic energy term where we've got a half mu x dot squared? We can similarly use the chain rule to find that the time derivative of a half mu x dot squared is just mu x dot and then from the chain rule x double dot, so the second time derivative of x that is supposed to be zero. Um, and notice that there's a common factor of x dot, so let's factor that out. We get x dot times mu x double dot um, plus u double prime of r naught um, times x. That's going to be zero. So there are actually two different solutions for the motion um, or the ev time evolution 
of this diatomic molecule. One is that x dot itself is zero, but that's kind of the uninteresting case because that's just saying it's not moving at all, right? Um, and so let's consider the more interesting case where the stuff inside the brackets is zero, right? Um, so if we take the case where x dot is not zero, in other words, where it's it's not just sitting there in equilibrium, um, we can say that mu x double dot plus u double prime of r naught times x is equal to zero. And this is just a simple harmonic motion equation. Okay, so this is just SHM, simple harmonic motion. Um, and there is an effective mass, okay, effective mass of mu. And there is also an effective spring constant um, of u double prime of r naught, right? Because the standard form of the SHM equation is mx double dot plus kx is equal to zero, where k is the spring constant. All right, and so if we combine those together, um, our omega squared, or our angular frequency squared for SHM um, is k over m in general, right? The spring constant over the mass. And so here, um, our angular frequency is going to be the square root of our effective spring constant u double prime of r naught divided by um, the effective mass or the reduced mass mu. Um, and there we go. We found the angular frequency of small oscillations um, of a diatomic molecule. And so what you could do if you wanted to is actually evaluate what r naught is using calculus given the functional form of u of r um, that we mentioned at the beginning. You can evaluate r naught and also find the second derivative of u of r plug that into your equation for the frequency and get out an actual number.